and ends on a high note. Okay. Well, I guess one of the big things I was wondering is, so obviously, Julian, you've been making strategy games for a very long time. Um, and I mean, over the course of that, how how is the process of making them changed for you? And then, I mean, I imagine you and Jacob talked this over before. So just in terms of like the way that both of you approach it, how is it different? Well, uh, well, these days I use spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess, um, especially with games with a lot more multiplayer focus, there is a lot more attention to game balancing going on. And... Um, uh, this is something I will need to pay a lot of attention to in, in Chaos Reborn. And, and I think there's this whole other aspect to design which just wasn't available to us uh, when I was programming my spectrum, is that is the ability to collect and analyze uh, data from players, you know, the metrics, uh, to figure out where the issues are with game balance and exploits. And, you know, if you've got an online game, you can collect all that data online so it can be... Uh, this is this whole new area of um, game design and analysis is is kind of opened up, and I, I don't know what kind of uh, analysis you did for balancing on, on say XCOM, Jake, but I I guess you probably tried to, to um, I, I guess you put a lot of effort into it, whereas you know perhaps in the old days that wasn't so much, to be honest. Well, you know it, it's interesting. It's something we we talk about and. Um, uh, we actually do use phrases here, but one of the phrases we use is, is to balance for awesome. So uh, the thing that we try to be careful of, which is different, if you have a, if you have a multiplayer focused game like Chaos, it balances inc- balancing for fairness is really, really important. Yeah. Um, but in XCOM, which we viewed as primarily a single player game, we, we always said balance for awesome, balance for awesome. We need to balance for player experience, not for yeah. uh, fairness. And so we would typically try to make sure that when the player used abilities or anything like that, that they would make, make sure that the player was able to feel like they were, well, awesome, feel like that, that there was a lot of meaning behind their choices and that there was a lot of reward for the tactical choices they made. So, but it, it is different in the sense of, you know, if you're doing something, you know, multiplayer, then balance becomes incredibly, incredibly important. And it yeah, really can of- sort of make or break because you can't balance for awesome because now you have you know who cares if the ai is like ah it's bullshit you know like uh i i always picture the you know the ai and xcom single player just being like that is such bullshit and and that's okay that's what we want but then when you have an mp game then of course the person on the end end of that is a human so so that's what's always tricky about that yeah, I, I think you've you've also got something very important, and it's something about uh, because the original XCOM was single player only, and the the balance that counted there was you know did the player uh, feel that the challenge he had was uh, interesting? I, it wasn't too easy, it wasn't too difficult, uh, and trying to that that's a kind of balance that is as you say it's about the player experience, and. Yep. It, even if your AI cheats, I mean, we we had some um, difficulty balancing factors built in the original XCOM, which uh, I originally added because we just didn't have enough time or manpower to QA the game in all its possibilities from beginning to end, large numbers of time to to get the balance right. So I actually had to put some dynamic difficulty adjustment factor in the game. And of course, the most uh, famous, the most famous bug of the original XCOM yeah, was yeah. the difficulty bug. And so you'd you'd put it on superhuman, and then you'd reload, right? And that and it, went, and it basically reset back to, uh, to the bottom, yeah, basic difficulty <laughs> yeah, level, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, we would always. Yeah, you, that's how you know if somebody's a real original XCOM player. You know? <laughs> oh, I beat the game on superhuman. You're like, mm, did you? Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, and so one of the things that I think is really resurfacing, in, especially in turn-based strategy, that both of you have a lot of experience with is having that sort of narrative layer within strategy, of having sort of the mechanics create a story in the player's mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so absolutely. Yeah. when you set out to create a game, when both of you do, how much is that in the forefront of your mind? How much is it? How can we make mechanics such that they sort of naturally create that story layer? Well, for me, this is... Uh, this is very important. I mean, with Chaos Reborn, 
it's going to be even more important because so much of the game content is algorithmically generated. It has to be done in such a way that the player feels that um, he really is going on an adventure in the in the realms of chaos and the um, you know the combination of of the different events that can happen in these realms are are the kind of is the story that the player is is building and yeah you can basically if you can tell a story about a game then then it's working so I mean for many games of Chaos Reborn that I've played there have been some moments in there which have been memorable enough to think well that was really cool and I can tell a story about it like the time that uh, my dragon was subverted and the animal wizard subverted it and I thought and then I subverted it back and uh, we all thought we were going to win the game from one turn to the next and that was kind of very amusing so you can if you can hey that's can, the story of our eagle Julian yeah well almost <laughs> yeah well actually the game that me and Nathan played earlier was quite funny because we were both caught in webs and the irony was that they were webs from what was Nathan's spider except of course I <laughs> subverted it <laughs> So Nathan Spider had managed to web both the wizards and we were standing <laughs> next to each other, webbed. <laughs> the spider was very was, confused. Yeah, and that, was right. quite, that, was quite, uh, that was quite a fun game. But, uh, so it's kind of, um, yeah, if you, if you can tell a story about the game you played and it, was, and, it, and it was a story which nobody created, but it was just from the experience that you had, I think that's really cool. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I always think of it as... Um, explicitly leaving gaps so instead of uh you know i think in a more traditional game you would think of constructing the narrative and trying to fill in gaps and in strategy games i think of it in terms of making sure that you're leaving gaps because the player um, enjoys filling those gaps in with their own experiences and you have to make sure that you leave big enough gaps that the player can then has has freedom to be creative and to fill in those gaps with their own stories because those are the, story, those are the stories that have the most meaning. And so we, we talk about that a lot, like making sure whenever we talk about anything that could potentially touch on narrative, we make sure that we're leaving big enough gaps that the player can fill in. So, hey, you know, does it have to be uh, uh, an actual character? Can it just be one of the player's soldiers? And, and, you know, let's make sure and leave that creative gap so then the player can fill it in and say, oh, yeah, they did that because... Uh, this sequence of events happened because I know that this happened and this happened and this guy doesn't like this guy and, you know, this soldier really likes this other soldier. And so we sort of think of it in terms of um, just instead of um, writing writing a script, you know, we sort of consider ourselves to be stage builders and we build a stage and we make the props and then we give them to the player and hopefully they do the, the storytelling. They do the heavy lifting for us because that's where obviously the most meaning comes in games like this. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. yeah. And I think on that front, the thing that makes XCOM so endearing is that it really like honed in on a specific aspect of that that's really powerful, which is your attachment to your own soldiers. Um, and that's sure. just such a, that, that's such a human thing you have this one entity that you can really identify with that's been with you for a long time and so you so you just sort of create a bond in your head um is it hard to to match or exceed that to like say how can we make a narrative just as powerful as xcoms that's different i mean i think it comes down to and this is what julian created this there's the idea there's no credit that I could certainly take for this. It really comes down to vulnerability. I mean, I think that if those soldiers are authentic, creative, um, uh, they're they're authentic characters because you feel the same emotions about you. You can feel a sense of loss about them, which is important. You you can feel actual tension about the the lives of these virtual characters because they're vulnerable. Because the game could say, "I don't." I don't care what you feel about this character. I'm going to take them away from you. And when you play other games, you you don't create that that you don't go through an emotional range with those characters because that whole side of the the range of tension and loss that's completely eliminated from the equation and you know that's not part of your relationship with that character. And so because you never go through that emotional journey where you worry for them or you get put into tough situations and you sort of bond, again, these are virtual characters, but you bond with these characters because you get in a tough situation together and they save your bacon or, you know, you worry for them and they survive. 
And because you're allowed to experience that full range of emotions, it creates a much deeper connection to that virtual character. And whereas other games can't let you into that emotional range yeah. because actually, they're not also, willing to give those characters up. Yeah, yeah, it also gives you this this really interesting um, kind of uh, sort of strategic or tactical decision to make that your your most um, attached characters, the ones as you say, or you're most attached to. Uh, tend to be your best ones, and it's always this question: Well, do you deploy them in dangerous situations where they can help you win a battle, uh, or do you try and protect them a little bit? And you know, if you take that risk and you lose them, it's going to be tragic. <laughs> and it's kind of um, uh, that was certainly features in the XCOM games quite strongly, and uh, that is the strength of them for sure. Yeah, yep. definitely. But when you're making new games or something entirely outside that universe, mm -hmm. do you ever approach it with like that? Not necessarily the specter of XCOM over, but just the the realization like you've made this one game where people identify so powerfully with their units that like how can you how can you make a narrative experience that powerful in a very different type of strategy game? Um, well, it might be difficult if they weren't characters and they were just like machines. Or <laughs> it depends how I think it depends more on how much you're invested in developing these characters or or. Unit, it could even be army units or whatever it is, and if uh, if you're invested in it and it's a part of the strategy of the game that you need to develop them, then yes, the, that sense of loss can be quite um, important. And you know, decisions about whether to deploy them or not is in dangerous situations becomes really significant and meaningful decisions. Uh, how can you do it in other games? No, I mean, Chaos Reborn takes a um, maybe a slightly different. Route in that because in a battle your creatures can feel kind of quite temporary, but you you certainly do feel sense of loss when when your dragon gets killed, for example. <laughs> um, but it's all it's all happens in a, like a microcosm. It's very quick, and you know the 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 emotions in a in a game of in a match of Chaos Reborn can be quite intense, but they 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 change from one turn to the next. Um, but in the um, in the sort of the the overarching theme or or, or longer term. Uh, messy game in, in terms of Chaos Reborn, more of this is invested in the social system which I wanted to put in. It's another way that you can develop characters it is in your relationship with uh, actually other players. So in Chaos Reborn, you, you, this, is, this is quite progressive as I uh, ex was explaining earlier. You start off as a lowly wizard but you can progress to wizard lord, then wizard king and you can take part in guilds and you can manage a guild and you can become a god. And each of those levels implies that you are, have a certain relationship with, with other players. And um, to play effectively at, at these roles, you, you need to develop those relationships with other players. So if you're a demigod running a cult or a guild, um, you need to make your guild attractive and you need to recruit followers. And if you do that, then you will get benefits from your god if he's playing well enough, then, then the god will be uh, giving favours to those who are doing well. So it's kind of, um, you can, you've got a social aspect to the development of the character which is, um, you know, makes it more uh, MMO-ish, even though it's not strictly speaking an MMO, but it, it has, you know, these, these social structures I think also have given a different aspect to um, what is essentially, we've got a strategy game with an MMO aspect to it. And it will be interesting to see how it works out. Hmm. <clears throat> it honestly reminds me a little bit, like that, that aspect reminds me a little bit of Peter Molyneux's goddess. It was the stuff he was <laughs> saying about it. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not quite sure which direction he's taking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure if anyone knows at this point. But uh, so another thing that I've noticed recently, and th this especially is, I think, true of chaos. There's a lot of board game influence moving into, especially oh, yeah. turn-based strategy, um, yeah. and I think yeah. board gaming has really like infiltrated the game, the video gaming industry recently. Like everyone's suddenly into board games; everyone loves them. Um, is that an area <laughs> of interest for you guys? Do you use that to influence your own game design? Well, for me, it's a massive influence, without a doubt. I mean, because that's where I came from originally. I was designing board games before even uh, uh, before even home computers existed. <laughs> You know, before Jake was born, probably. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, 
But it's very interesting about board games is that the, the design and evolution of board games has been really quite dramatic over the last uh, 15 or so years, 20 years maybe, since the release of Settlers of Catan. And, um, and this has been an evolution which hasn't been driven by technology. It's been driven by game design, although you could say it's been driven in part by the, the internet. Um, and uh, one interesting thing is that we, we get a lot of conversions of board games onto like iPad, and I play quite a few of these, and some of them are really good implementations of board games. Um, but they do miss something of what board games are about, which is that face-to-face -face -face interaction with uh, human beings. But um, still, they seem to be popular. And, 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 um, and this is really great because, um, you know, uh, platforms like the iPad are very good for doing board games with a touch interface. Turn-based games are very good for you know iPad and stuff. And I think um, there there is a there's a lot of uh, really really good design in board games at the moment, which um, we can learn from. And and if some of that that design in board game was made and adapted to um, you know computer games, which are de you know designed as computer games, and you know turn-based strategy games. On PC, Mac, Linux could uh, could really become uh, you know even even better. We'll, we'll see even more high quality titles, and there are some being developed on Kickstarter which look uh, really cool, um, uh, like Armello, for example, which is going through its Kickstarter at the moment. It really oh, that looks even, awesome! Yeah, yeah. it's a uh, and they put, they put it uh, you know they they pose it directly as a digital board game, and I'm not ashamed yeah. about saying that. And they developed their prototype as a board game, but it is going to be a purely digital board game. And you know they've obviously made use of uh, you know, random generation algorithms to make the, to build their map and their quest and everything. So I think it's really cool what we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, we have um, two of our lead designers at at Firaxis are also board game designers. So um, Ananda uh, Gupta, who was the lead designer on Enemy Within Expansion Pack, he's also a board game designer, and he designed Twilight Struggle, which is a really uh, yeah awesome, awesome. yeah yeah. So he that's like a really high rated board game, and so he, and then Ed Beach, who's our our lead Civ designer, and he also is a board game designer, designed Here I Stand and um. Virgin Queen, but he they're they're both both um, game designers at Fraxis and also really good board game designers. So for us, there's a lot of I, I would be hopeless as a board game designer, I think. But I, I have <laughs> but always really it's really neat how it's you know they really focus on mechanics like there's a can um, that are, are similar in the sense that if you're making strategy games, it's really about mechanics, and so that's obviously we have a lot of the same roots there. Uh, but the way they deal with um, theme, I think, is really interesting. They can get a lot of story with even less of the tools that that we have. And so I always find it really instructive when I play a board game. And then I'm like, wow, that is a really great sense of place and ambiance and, and theme. Then I look at how they do that because they're, they're masters at that. Um, but it's true that you can't really translate one-to-one -one because so much of board games is the social aspect. I mean, it just so much of that is that social aspect. So mm -hmm. it, it's interesting how we can use the same tools but have different outcomes there. Yeah, yeah. but I think you touched on some interesting thing that, that board, good board game designers can really extract a lot of theme and flavor from um, minimal mechanics and, mm -hmm. and interactions, which is, is really quite a, a special skill, I think, and a very valuable one. Yeah, and something we could, in strategy games, we could learn a lot there. And I, I think that it, that's always been helpful having board game designers work here is because they, they have fewer things, fewer tools at their disposal. And that's always something I always like draw inspiration from. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, going back to something that I sort of asked a little bit earlier, um, you, you talk about like the simplicity of a, or not even necessarily the simplicity, but a board game's mechanics in terms of extracting a lot from very little. Um, when you make these games, are you ever tempted to be like, man, I've, I've been making strategy games for so long, let's just make some sort of crazy esoteric like thing that's just layered in tons of mechanics and weird ideas? I mean, <laughs> honestly, I, 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 on, I, I say this, and this always sounds like some aw shucks thing, but it's <laughs> not like, I'm not... I, I, one of my greatest benefits as a designer is I'm not that smart. I mean, like, I... I if if there are too many mechanics going on, my eyes glaze over and I go, okay, I can't figure it out. Like so, I, 
there's no danger of that happening because I do not have the mental strength to put something like that together. I, I tend to go <laughs> towards simple just because that's what I appreciate as a, as a player. And I, I don't think I could do some really, really hardcore, um, like really like deep mechanics driven, you know, well, everything strategy mechanics, driven, but like piling on mechanics. I'm not saying that, that that can't be an interesting experience once you learn how to play. But for me, I, I always really respond to the, well, so chaos is a very good example. There's something that, Again, that, well, that's the dream, right? Is you make something that's simple, but then the more and more you play it, the more you realize, like, okay, you, you like develop all these different strategies because the tools are simple, but then it's actually the interactions are very complex. And so, again, that's how Sid, you know, I, I obviously I get a lot of influence on that from Sid. That obviously is his style is to think simple first. So, I don't know. It'd be nice, I suppose, to be some sort of have some sort of vanity project where it's just like, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm just going to pile mechanic <laughs> upon mechanic <laughs> and have a 400-page a manual. And if you really want to know, you'll have to read the manual. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I yeah, well, I've, I've been down this, this route before a little bit with um, XCOM Apocalypse, which was getting so complicated that... Um, you know, the final game was simplified from from the original design, and it wasn't it wasn't simplified enough because we were just trying to do too much with it. And um, I don't think I will make that mistake again because it just it makes your job far too difficult. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> it makes the development hell as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're doing yeah, that, I mean, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. The, no, I was just saying that the danger there is the. Um, and I, I think that's what, if, if there's anything that I really like about strategy games today, you know, the, the danger there is always to go down the, the flight simulator route or the real-time strategy route where things tend to become more and more focused and targeted to a more and more enthusiastic but but narrow audience. And then what happens is that, and again, it's not about dumbing anything down. It's more about making your mechanics so esoteric that people can't appreciate them and, and fewer and fewer people can appreciate them. And then at some point it just becomes this real burden for regular people to play. And that's the story. I, I just remember the, you know, like Falcon 4.0. I was, I was one of those guys who was so excited for that, but you know, you get to a point where oh, the wow. flight sim manuals were like this thick and you're like, okay, I'm flying a jet. I'm actually flying a jet here. This is harder than if I'd gone to flight school. So <laughs> there, there's always a, a danger there of, of, going down that route, I think. Hmm. Well, and yeah, just come to think of it, it's interesting how turn-based strategy and real-time strategy have diverged from one another. Because you do mm -hmm. have kind of a more, like on the turn-based side, there is kind of more of a movement right now toward a simplified, streamlined type of setup that a lot of people can play. Whereas like real-time has been embraced a lot by like the esports community. And so like right. the games are still, they're not hyper-complex necessarily, but there are a lot of games with, you know, more layers to the, or, yeah, more initial layers at least. Uh, look, I there's no there's no inherent value in in complexity, and I'm not talking about MOBAs because those are actually beautifully designed. Yeah. But in terms of turn-based strategy, there's no inherent value in complexity, and it's the things I'm I'm least proud of as a designer are when you can in strategy when you get backed into a corner, you can say fuck it, put another system on it. You know, like, this isn't that fun. Just add another system, you know. And the things I'm least proud of are where I feel like I've overcomplicated things. And it just, you know, I, I think sometimes it could be a muddle. And, and I think that that's not. But again, like, it's obvious with chaos, Julian, and it's pretty obvious <laughs> that you've gone towards something that you've kind of achieved this balance of it's it's deep. It's very, very replayable. But at the same time, like learning to play is a piece of cake. Like you don't have hit points even. Like no, I remember I was, <laughs> when I first played, I was like, what the, where are the, where are the hit points? You know, <laughs> but then it was like, there are no hit points. And then of course I don't miss them, but it's the sort of thing where stripping those things out allows you to have more interesting interactions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and also more, more tense and dynamic situations as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it is. Yeah, it's probably hit on one of the most controversial. Well, yeah, but maybe it's one of the most controversial things that, that you know. Where are the hit points? Because it's become such a standard thing in uh, almost every game that you know everything has to have hit points, and you have to wear it down before it dies. And it's kind of 
and you have a kind of war of attrition where it's just you're just wearing each other's armies out until they just sort of fade away. Um, but yeah, it can be a bit like that, and um, in, in a way, it's, it makes Chaos Reborn uh, still a little bit unique compared with with many other turn-based fantasy games out there. And I, I'm quite happy that it's still a bit fresh and unique, even though it's you know the origin is 30 years old. Um, but it's right. I mean, complexity in itself can be a, a big problem, and you know, even the you know the best board game designers are very aware of this because when you're designing board game, players have to learn the rules, they have to read rule books, and you know, I mean, it's it gets to be a real obstacle very quickly. Um, I mean, I I do like lots of you know nice details in in my strategy games. I mean, I kind of uh, kind of admire the New Age of Wonders game for a bit because it's got it's full of detail and lots of uh, it's a lot of different stats, but actually it's it's very very playable especially the tactical combat side, so I, I kind of, you know, I, I do enjoy a certain level of complexity, um, but it's still got to be, have a good playable interface and it's, it's got to, uh, you know, the, the information's got to be meaningful and it can enable you to, to make uh, decisions rather than have to try and figure out how everything works. And you know, these days I I tend to like mechanics which were much more, which are much more explicit so that just by knowing the very basic rules of how things interact, you you know, there's nothing really sort of hidden going on. And um, you know, with Chaos Reborn, there are one or two things which may be more difficult to grasp, but if you look at it, the rules are actually very simple. And once you understand that, then you know, it kind of makes sense, and then you know, you're away. So and, and it allows for discovery too, which yeah, I've it does. which I've definitely felt in Chaos is that if if the rules are straightforward enough, then it's so much better as a player to have moments of discovery rather than having the game tell me, oh, and now you can do this super special strategy or ability. <laughs> Instead, if it's straightforward enough, you have moments of discovery, and that's like the magic yeah. moment as a player when you're like, yeah. oh, I pulled off this strategy that I developed myself. So yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and yeah, speaking of just that whole sort of side of things, of having players interact with your games, um, the other thing that Chaos especially has going for it is obviously like, you've got a demo out there now, you have a game that anyone can play, and I guess as you progress in development, like I imagine backers will get their hands on various builds and stuff, so you're always going to have sure. that element of people interacting with your game. Whereas on the AAA yeah. side of things, that's not so prevalent, at least not yet. No, it's um, not. Sure. I mean, AAA development, you, you actually require to hire uh, entire specialist companies that, you know, have huge focus groups and they collect metrics from players who are all playing secretly and they have to sign NDAs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, it kind of, uh, AAA development, it has to, everything has to be kind of uh, managed internally in a way, so it can be more difficult. Well, I mean... Um, when when you when you guys at Firaxis like see this and see this evolution and sort of the more indie side of things, do you ever sit down and think like, what if we just did that? Like, what if we just gave builds to our community and kind of worked with them? Well, I mean, that's part of the benefit of being able to work on you know, let's say a franchise like Civ is that you do have you have a very very active community. And so, again, that may happen at larger chunks between iterations, but I think that we view what we do here as, uh, we don't view our, ourselves as, um, you know, lone visionaries out there bringing, bringing our vision of, of what this game should be to, to fans, but instead this is really kind of a service. When, when you work on a franchise, it really becomes what you do is a service. And, and, what, and so when people say this about, your title and and you're you're blessed enough to have millions of people playing the title you get a lot of feedback and then you can then parse that and say you know you you don't worry if if it's criticism that's fine and you look at that and that's frankly what you hunger for and so you look at that and you're able to draw some very you know very specific conclusions about what you did that was successful and what you didn't and then that way you sort of take that going forward so it's it's certainly harder you know working on enemy unknown when it was completely um uh, no you know nobody knew about it it was there was nobody there was nothing to play you know then you kind of have to go off your own idea of like well i think people will like this and obviously it's not like i invented that game out of the air there was i there's i forget some british guy but whatever but uh, some <laughs> guy 
made some game, but uh, it's <laughs> it was loosely based on that. But um, but the idea is that when you're part of a franchise and Civ especially, then you really do have a very large, you know, vocal, vibrant community that allows you to get that feedback, and so it's a lot easier to design once you have that community. And you and you, we certainly at Firaxis, we that's a big part of how we design. Certainly, it is one of those things though, where like Julian can be super reactive with chaos like yep. you know one day like hey the the community is upset about this aspect of this build the next day there can be a build where all of that's tweaked whereas you don't quite have yep. that benefit and i mean i think with like XCOM, especially when you guys were working on it there was always that looming question of are they going to get it right are they gonna are they doing it well did they totally fuck it up um and i right. think that's sort of once again a bit of a question with the new civ because it's like okay it's going back to alpha centauri which everyone loves like right. are they going to get it right and so i mean right. Is there ever a temptation to just like to have that more reactive process to say like okay well let's just put a build out there and see what people think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk strategy for you know for the the company, but certainly I think as a designer yeah i mean there's obviously you you would hunger for that kind of feedback i mean to me it's always interesting because to be in that situation i think that you have to uh feedback is the most useful thing you can get and at the same time you have to also steer the ship towards a destination to where you think is the best for the product and so i think it's interesting um if you have it in a relatively like let's say like chaos where it's it's clear what the game is going to be tactically. And, you know, the good news is it's really, really awesome, you know? And so I, then I think at that point, getting feedback is really, that's, that seems like it would be really valuable. Um, it's just a question of, I suppose, when you get that feedback and at what time your game reaches a state at which that kind of feedback would be useful. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, from our point of view, I mean, we'll, we're I'm a very small developer. So having uh, the involvement of, you know, a community of gamers early on in the process can be very beneficial, I and mean, we don't need a huge QA team, and we don't we don't need to, um, you know, we, we can test and you know, as Nathan says, we can change things and develop things relatively quickly. And um, now, having the the Chaos Reborn prototype, I mean, it doesn't have a lot of uh, graphics in it. There's almost no animation in it, but it has a you know a core gameplay there, which is enough to make some decisions about you know whether this game is going to work or not, you know, whether it's fun or not, and you know it gives us some uh, information about you know, which things maybe not working so well. So uh, this can be very valuable. So we don't need you know, like a team of QA people. Or we don't need to have focus groups and stuff like that. And uh, I think for any independent developer, involving your players in your development process can can be very beneficial. Um, Unless you're Peter Mullen, you of course, uh, but you know it kind of uh, it can backfire as well because I think it, it's a very tough discipline because you need to um, go back to the old sort of Nintendo approach that you need to find the fun in the gameplay quickly, uh, however rough it might be. Otherwise, your you know your project is stopped. It doesn't go any further. You know if it's not fun, you can't fix it. Yep. You've got to do something different. And you know that's it can be a pretty harsh lesson, and but you can get that feedback very quickly if you put something out there for people to play and react to, and um, you know it, it can be very helpful to uh, steer you in the right direction in some cases, and it can you know it can help to you know reassure you that you're kind of on the right track and you need to do more of what you're doing, which is which is cool. So I'm very pleased with the reaction to the. Chaos Reborn prototype. We did have some, you know, there are bugs in it, of course. There are problems. Uh, and it's very minimal in, in the way it works, but there, there's enough there, I think, for people to have some, some idea of what the final game might be like. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Let's see. Oh, yeah, so I was wondering this one. Um, how much do you guys, like, actually communicate? Because obviously, you know, you have both done XCOM in various capacities. But I mean, like, because of that... We're video chatting right now as you speak to us. I bet you didn't <laughs> know this, but we're video chatting right now. 
I thought I just yeah. isolated you and synced it all up really nicely. So it only appeared that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's kind of, um, I, mean, I have a habit of working in isolation from many, many years uh, ago, and I'm trying to break out of it. So I, I, I really like to get feedback on the stuff. And uh, um, I mean, when I first talked to you, Jacob was probably um, towards the end of the the, the XCOM development. Yeah. And we had yep. a, we had another good chat, of course, at uh, GDC last year when uh, yeah. we did a great interview together. And it's kind of there was a lot of attention on XCOM stuff at the time. And uh, you know, I kind of uh, and it's great to have have Jake back in the case for Bill Project. I mean, he's he's been uh, you know tweeting about it and stuff, and I invited him to play a game uh, this afternoon with me, and we had another game. We see a few few games this evening, so it's been really cool and. Uh, Right, and as I said, it's literally the least I could do for Julian, the creator of XCOM. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, we've it's it's actually been really, really obviously for me. It's been neat to have both the the XCOM opportunity to talk to Julian, and then um, with the Chaos Reborn. I mean, it's it was great for me. Then the first time I played it, and I was like, ah. Oh, this is good. I was gonna, I was gonna like sing this to high heaven anyway, but you know, it actually is incredibly, incredibly <laughs> good. So you know, that makes the sales job a lot easier. So, um, but no, it's been, it's been neat. Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, Julian, why, why did you tend toward isolation in the way that you worked previously? Well, um, well, going back to, I mean, when I made the first. Chaos. I mean, it was back in 1984. Um, I was working by myself on my Spectrum. There's no internet for a start. <laughs> I had friends who played uh, board games, role-playing games, and I used to test Chaos on them. But you don't really get any reaction to what you're doing until the game is released and you see some reviews. And even then, the original Chaos, I didn't even see any sales figures from my recollection. I mean, it was kind of the deal I had wasn't that good. And you don't get that connection with your players, you don't immediately get that connection with other developers because I was literally working completely by myself. So I kind of, um, in a way, that can become a bit of a habit. And, um, and it's one of the reasons I, I joined Ubisoft here in, in Sofia when I, uh, after I came to Bulgaria, is that I wanted to work with a team of people again because I actually, you know, I, I discovered I really like working with a team of creative people and it's, um, and you get lots of feedback and um, on your ideas, and you can you know, have lots of uh, um, inter you know interaction in your, in your thought processes, and it, that's that's really valuable to me now. Um, but you know, the, the habit of uh, just sitting down and coding is still something I really enjoy. It's just uh, sitting down at my computer. There's no one else around, and I'm just uh, coding and designing away and, and making stuff. It's still kind of is. Uh, you know, so something like that lone creative streak is still there with me. <laughs> There's, there is, there is nothing better, and that is, that is me. That that's exactly how I am too, and that's I know for a fact that's how Sid is too. You know, there's nothing better than being able to sit down and and just write code and make the design a reality and and spend a long period of time without interruption, just working like that's yeah, yeah. I think that's still a big 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 part of it uh, that's my favorite times for sure so well and so how do you deal with that temptation to just go isolate yourself versus like knowing hey maybe the game right now needs more pairs of eyes on it maybe like i even though i'm really enjoying this part of the process maybe i need to break out of it yeah well the thing is when i've got something working i i always want people to play it this is this is I, i've got no problems with you know the the game falling flat on its face. I I just really want to to get people's reaction to it. I I don't have that fear that it's you know not going to work or um, it is going to be crap. I'm not worried about really what people are going to say uh, is bad about it if I agree with them. You know if it's if it makes sense. So yeah, getting reaction to what you're doing as part of the creative process is is in, still very important to me and you have to reach out to people to do that and um, you know I mean with a lot of people who may not be very comfortable with that but I, I really appreciate getting um, reactions to to what I'm doing and you know even where it's negative and it's justifiable then that's still useful I, there's no problem with that um, 
but yeah, I, I, you know, I really want people to to play what I'm making. So at a certain point, you can't, you've got to come out and expose your creation to the world. <laughs> hmm. And for me, I like to do it sooner rather than later. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I mean, yeah, I could ask you guys questions all day, but you probably have stuff to do. So I will conclude on what is. I mean, obviously, you're both still making games as a genre, so you you have something that you want to like. You don't feel like you're done here. So, I mean, what is what is the goal for both of you? What's the thing that you or what are the things that you hope to accomplish just within the spe spectrum of creating turn-based strategy games? What's the thing you still feel like you haven't done? I I want to make turn-based strategy games really cool again. <laughs> it's still uh, it's still my ambition. I still think there's a long way to go to to reach a wider audience. I, I still think it's possible, and um, I'll do my best to achieve it. Um, well, for you know, for me, it's it's funny being at at um, Fraxis. I, I always kind of look up to the uh, the Civ guys, and so for me, it's it's basically I look at what they do and what they've done with that, and I just kind of want to. They have such a great. Um, Community, they've got such a great replayable game. For me, it's always kind of like looking at them and saying, "All right, what what can we do to to um to sort of um, reach those heights?" But I mean, I I don't know. I'm I'm I I guess I'm the kind of I feel lucky to to uh to be here and to do this. And I you know I I don't know. I, I feel like um I know it sounds like I have no motivation and no like ambition <laughs> when I say it like that, but I, I I think my goals are just smaller in in the sense that you know I think just uh, trying to again you know make small improvements and you know sort of look at what other people have done and, and sort of reach those reach those goals. But for me, it's you know it's. Smaller than making turn-based cool, so I, I, that, that I, I will leave to Julian, and then I will gladly ride that wave. If he does that, I will gladly ride that wave, like I've done with most of my career, frankly, is ride the Julian Gallup wave. I'll just ride that thing into the shore, so I'm not ashamed to admit, okay? I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Julian. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. It was good talking to both of you for an inordinately long amount of time. Thank you for taking so much of your time out to do this. You're welcome. No, thank you very much. And everybody back Chaos. Everybody play Chaos, and then you will want to back it on Kickstarter. See, I did that so you don't have to, Julian. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, yeah, thanks again, and it was good talking. All right. Bye. Bye.